afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CMC Markets on the 4th of March, Friday the 4th of March. And today's US employment report for February. Um, I think we can safely assume, once I get past the disclaimers, which I have to do as a matter of course and compliance, I think it's safe to assume that I think today's employment report is going to be background noise when it comes to what's going on with respect to the movements in the wider market. Um, we've already heard from Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell earlier this week that um, it's uh, highly likely that the Federal Reserve will raise rates by 25 basis points when they meet in just under two weeks time. There was some debate that they might be inclined to move towards a 50 basis point rate hike. Um, the bond buying, the asset purchases end this month. There was, there was some speculation, particularly after the payrolls report that we saw last month, when we saw those huge revisions um, to the January and December numbers, uh, revisions of up to 800,000. And then obviously this week's ADP payrolls report um, for uh, January, which was revised up from minus 301,000 to plus 509. I mean, what sort of a revision is that? Yeah, you're talking, you're talking 810,000 jobs, a swing in the space of a single month. So, you know, in terms of, of the wider numbers, the numbers are important in the context of the US economy because why they, what, while they won't tell you an awful lot about what the Fed is going to do in just under two weeks time, what they will do is give you an indication as to what they might do in May and subsequent months. And I think that probably is, is, is the, wider, the wider debate because it, it indicates the strength of the US economy more broadly. And the US economy is, is much stronger than its European counterpart, and therefore it's much more able to absorb more rate hikes. And I think in that context, that will dictate how Euro dollar performs. Having said that, Euro dollar today has broken below 110 for the first time since May 2020. Um, and we can see that here on this daily chart. I make that a weekly chart that'll condense it a little bit more and you'll you can see what I'm looking at in the overall scheme of things and you can see from that chart there if I draw a trend line from those lows all the way back here at 103.40 and then through the um, lows back in 2020 you're looking at the potential for further losses to test that line and that line comes in around about 108.20 so we're at 109.33 at the moment, having broken below 110. 110 has triggered a whole host of stop losses. We're probably going to kick. Um, we're probably going to kick quite a bit lower in terms of euro dollar on this particular chart um, towards 108.20, and um, towards that red line that I've highlighted um, all the way across here. The line of least resistance. Essentially, you know, you know the way. You've 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 listened to enough of my webinars, presentations, and what have you to know that I'm very much a levels trader. And sorry, I'm just going to have to turn something off because I forgot to kill, um, I forgot to kill my chat and I need to do that now um, while I still can. So please go away, sir. I don't want to talk to you. Sorry about that. Um, I always forget to do something when I haven't done one of these for a while. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, um, I'm very much a levels trader. Once we broke below this low here at around about 111, there was always going to be a test push lower. And that's essentially what we've seen over the course of the past few days or the past three or four days. And the turnaround has been quite significant and it's likely to continue. Um, irrespective of today's payrolls report, but I will be paying particular attention to two numbers. As I said, the labour participation rate, um, which 
did improve last month. It went up to uh, 62.2, which was much better than the previous month when it was 61.9. And it was the best number since March 2020 when it was 63.4. And before that, it was 63.7. So there's still an awful lot of what I would call tightness in the US labor market. And there's still 11 million job vacancies. So what I also want to see is an improvement in the wages numbers, the average hourly earnings numbers. And they came in at 5.7% in January, and they jumped up from 4.9. So the expectation is for an improvement to 5.8 from 5.7. Um, assuming that the labor market is tight, people are returning to the workforce as all of those stimulus checks from last year start to run out and they need to go out and basically pay for goods and services. And because rising inflation is, is erosing, eroding, eroding, eroding their disposable income, you would expect to see wage growth improve as well. So as long as we don't get a, an outlier of a payrolls number, and, I, and even if we do, it's not going to change the calculus with respect to the Federal Reserve acting um, in 12 days time. So stronger dollar, I think, is really my baseline scenario. We've already seen the dollar index break out. We've seen, seen the CMC dollar index also break out towards the upside from here. And as you can see from here, we've got a hell of a long way to go before we get back to the levels that we saw all the way back in March 2020. So this 990 area here is going to be very, very key for the CMC dollar index. If we break above these series of highs, then we're likely to see further gains going forward. Sterling dollar, similar sort of story. It hasn't been, or cable, similar sort of story. We're starting to break down. I still think that we'll probably now that we now that we've been unable to get back above this trend line here, we're probably going to come back here to 130.160. These are the lows all the way back in December. A stronger dollar should bring us back down here. It should drag euro dollar lower. It should also, to a certain extent, drag euro sterling lower, because even though euro dollars made um, new new lows, cable hasn't, and that's a large consequence of the fact that euro sterling um, is actually losing ground as well. We've broken below, um, hit the lowest levels since the Brexit referendum back in 2016. And we can see that here. So go all the way back here. And this is the last time we were at these sorts of levels. We've broken below this twi these twin lows in 2020 of 82.70. So the fact that we've broken below 82.70 and look to be able to sustain that move suggests that we're probably going to head back towards around about another, well, at least another 100 points lower to around about 81.70 and potentially 81. It's going to be a painful process. Euro sterling is probably one of the most painful currency pairs I've come across, um, and it's likely to remain so. Equity markets. Right, let's look at this because this could be interesting. We've broken down on the FTSE 100. We've broken this little trend line here. I'm now going to remove that so it's not cluttering the screen. We've now testing this trend line from these lows back in 2020. We really want to hold above this line here. We also we also need to hold above 6,800 if we do break below it. Now we've gone and we've done an impulsive move lower, and that's important. We've gone as low as 69.80 there or thereabouts. So how we behave at this sort of area through here also happens to coincide with the November lows. The 69, 70, 80 is going to be very, very key in terms of the next support for the FTSE 100. If we can hold here, we, sh we, we I would like to see a fairly decent rebound back to around about 70, 50, 70, 60, there or thereabouts. Given the fact that we've come so far this week, I would be surprised if we go much further. But in this febrile market, anything can happen. And that's something that we all very, need to be very aware of. Headline risk in this market is going to be a clear and present danger to any open positions that you might have. Now, obviously, we saw last weekend 
a complete 180 turn on the part of EU leaders with respect to sanctioning Russian banks. So in the lead up to last Friday and uh, last weekend, we had the rather shabby spectacle of Italian policymakers, lawmakers looking for a carve out for Gucci for Russian sanctions. Um, you know, something that I think they they realized in the cold light of day was, um, well, yeah, it was, it was pretty shameful. Um, and they were persuaded perhaps that maybe that wasn't such a good look. And on the Monday morning, the markets came aggressively lower. And obviously that was, that was, um, that was last Friday. And obviously since then we've seen a complete reversal of fortune. And that gives you an indication. Those two candles there give you a complete indication. You know, this was fudging the sanctions, fudging the sanctions. Oops, maybe not. No, let's really go all in and hit Russian banks. And this is where we are at the moment. And then obviously, of course, we've got this morning's news about the Russian nuclear reactor. Now we've got the DAX. The DAX is also approaching some fairly key support levels as well. This level here. Now I've done some FIB levels from the lows back in 2020 to the peaks all the way back in earlier this year. 13,100, fairly key support level on the DAX. Um, obviously the DAX is getting hit harder than most simply because of the fact that um, Germany and pretty much Europe is on the front line of this war. You've got PPI prices, factory gate prices, input prices already above 30%. You've got CPI at a record high of 5.8% in the EU. And that's before all of these inflation spikes that we've seen in industrial metals, in energy and in agricultural commodities. I mean, wheat alone is up 50% year to date. And it's unlikely that that is going to come down anytime soon unless we can some magic up some spare capacity from somewhere for the missing um, output that um, Russia and Ukraine bring to market. So we're very much reliant on a good harvest elsewhere in the world. So all of these rising costs are going to hit the margins of European companies going forward. They're going to hit the cost of living and they're going to get hit their input costs. So profits are going to be lower. There was an article on Bloomberg earlier today saying that European outflows last week uh, were at a record level. Well, if they're at a record level last week, God only knows what they've been like or going to be like this week. So we're looking um, at some very key support levels for European indices ahead of the weekend. Um, so as I said, that's why the payrolls numbers are probably neither here nor there. They will probably give a, a steer in terms of what the Fed will do after March, particularly when it comes to balance sheet reduction, when it comes to pretty much everything else and um, you know policy more broadly. But um, overall, in the wider scheme of things, when it comes to yields, yields at the moment aren't reacting to inflation risk. What they are reacting to is they're reacting to general risk off. You can see that here in this US Treasury, in this US 10-year Treasury and UK gilt as well. We've seen some big falls in that as people buy US Treasuries, uh, UK gilts, German bonds, they've gone back into negative territory because they're recycling money out of stocks and back into the haven trade, despite rising inflation risk. At some point, those, those yields will start to come back up again. But for the here and now, what you're seeing is an awful lot of capital flow into safe haven bonds and to a lesser extent, gold as well. But even with gold, we've got to be, we've got to be very, very aware that there's a big level of resistance all the way up near 1965, 1975, 1980. And then of course, you've got the record highs of August 2020 as well. So we are approaching record highs on gold. So we also need to be aware of that. And obviously the NASDAQ as well, US markets are holding up fairly well, still above their January lows. So we do need to be aware of that. So the numbers are coming out in around about 30 seconds. So I can quickly do that. Resistance on the S&P, 14,380. Very quickly, resistance on the, sorry, that was the NASDAQ. Uh, resistance on the S&P is around about 4,400. And again, above the January lows, holding up better than European markets, largely on the basis of their geographical location more 
than anything else. So the numbers are out, coming out shortly, and I will be quiet and wait for the numbers to hit the tape. And here we go. Average hourly earnings, well, that's a big drop. It's 5.1% um, on the US, so that's a big drop. Unemployment rate falls to 3.8%. So that's a fairly decent number. Headline 678, fairly decent number there. Looking for a revision on the January number and not seeing one yet. And I'm not seeing a participation rate number quite yet either. So let's do 678 on the payrolls number. I'm just going to publish that to the platform so that you guys can see it. Three point eight on the unemployment revision, two month payroll net revision. Still not seeing a revision for January. Um, average hourly earnings on a month on month basis, and um, that's been revised down. So that's potentially that's dollar that's slightly dollar negative. That so you could actually see euro dollar start to squeeze higher on the back of those um, those wages numbers because we dropped from five point eight to five point one. Um, which means that we're definitely going 25 basis points in March. And the big question is now, what's happened to wage growth in the US economy? It appears to have stalled out. The revision, 481. So only a modest revision on the January number by 14,000 higher. Participation rate, 62.3%. So again, that's slightly higher. So again, the US labor market still looks in fairly decent shape. The disappointing one, though, is this here. Revised down from 5.7 to 5.5 in January for wages and 5.1 well below expectations for um, the February, February numbers there. So let's have a look to see what that does to the overall picture when it comes to dollar yen. Keep an eye on this trend line on dollar yen. This is this is going to be a very, very key support level. It's been in place pretty much since September last year. It's like it's a little bit like watching paint dry dollar yen, but it is a generally decent bellwether of um, overall dollar sentiment. But over, but overall, we're getting a squeeze higher now in euro dollar. And I would expect to see that on the back of those wages numbers. So you're getting a little bit of a rebound on euro um, there, Steve. So that might help you um, in terms of your euro Aussie position. Um, a weaker dollar will definitely help you in that and help you pull back on your Euro Aussie. In terms of Aussie dollar, because I know I'm going to get asked that, is that um, you will find that we've we've broken higher on Aussie dollar above the 200 day moving average today. The big question I think we have, I have with respect to that, is can we hold above the 200 day moving average? Let me just draw a trend line in here from these peaks back in 2021 see whether or not I can yeah that line there means that we've still got a little bit of more upside in in Aussie dollar maybe a test back to this 74 area 7450 perhaps in the short to medium term but certainly in terms of this weaker dollar number that may help you out on a little bit of a pullback on your euro Aussie on your euro Aussie position let's have a look at that for you Steve so you can get a bit get a get a decent look at it on a slightly shorter term basis it's probably not helping you that much thinking about it no it's not not as much help as perhaps it would have been probably because there's not much not much stuff going on it's all it's all dollar flow at the moment so um but certainly as certainly a, a drop in the value of the euro will help you getting a bit of a rebound in stock markets more broadly as well on the back of of that number right does anyone have any questions on anything that i haven't quite covered yet Right, I've just lost, just lost my chat, just lost my chat box. 
One other thing to keep an eye out for, it's just occurred to me, I was doing Brent crude earlier today, and there's a fairly decent resistance level comes in. It's a long way back, mind you, from 2012. And it's 126 and a half. 126 and a half dollars there. So So we've got that resistance there. And obviously we've obviously also got yesterday's highs at 120. So there is still there is still potential further upside on Brent crude, still potential further upside on gold. Uh, certainly seeing that at the moment. It's certainly being driven by very much risk off Brent crude, higher, West Texas higher. Actually been slightly more orderly the move higher in WTI than it has for Brent. Let's have a look at the longer term targets on that. It's slightly less cluttered this particular chart. But again, you've got these series of peaks all the way back through here. So if I draw that line in there, then we're pretty much through them on WTI. So WTI is actually running ahead of Brent when it comes to the peaks back in 2010, 2012. There's a slight disconnect there. But um, overall, this is very much a supply story when it comes to WTI and pretty much every other commodity on the planet. Um, sterling, yet Canada yen. Da, 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 okay. Right, I will start with Canada yen. Right. Let's see if I can find that. There we go. I can remember when I used to trade Aussie yen back in the day when I was at Commonwealth Bank of Australia. That was fun because it was usually the Aussie that moved it. Well, that's shaping up quite nicely, old Canada yen. Fairly decent resistance at around about 92, right in the middle of it at the moment. So certainly I think in terms of Canada yen, there's potential for further downside there, a retest of this trend line from the lows through here. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on that. Actually, if we extend that back, we can actually make that a slightly longer line. Probably not as useful as perhaps this one here. So Canada yen looks as if it's probably going to drift back down towards the 200-day moving average and support here, where we where we could find a little bit of a rebound. But certainly, I think Canada yen does look as if it's probably going to head back lower while below 92. So certainly, a stop loss below 90, stop loss above 92, might be a a bit of a Bit of a trade there. Um, what else? Sterling yen. Absolutely, surf. Sterling yen. Right, that's sitting on cloud support at the moment and these series of lows through here. So again, approaching a fairly key support level. Let me just extend that back to see whether or not it's an actual relevant line. It's quite interesting to see how this 152.80 level has acted as a resistance and a support over time. So it'll be interesting to see how it reacts in and around these lows on any test lower today. Might be worth, um, might act as a little bit, might prompt a little bit of a rebound back into the cloud cover that we've got here. This is these are the sorts of patterns that I like that I like to look for when I'm looking for support and resistance areas to see areas where a market has acted as support and resistance in equal measure. And certainly we've got that in sterling yen. But obviously, if we do break below there, then we're going to break quite significantly back towards this series of lows all the way back at 149, 
around about there. Sterling in, hopefully that helps. Stolomex, your pet favorite, Steve. Yep, okay, let's have a look at that. I'm surprised you're still playing around with that. I mean, that must be like watching paint dry. Okay, let's have a look at that. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's heading in the right direction, assuming you're still long. Um, Russian ruble. Well, you might as well stick with it. You've been long, you've been long of it enough. <laughs> you've been long of it long enough, so you might as well stick with it now. You might as well run it with a fairly decent stop. At least it's starting to move for you today. Um, yeah, Russian ruble at the moment. It's um, currently suspended. It's, uh, it's on reduce only, so you can't trade Russian ruble at the moment because it's on reduce only. So you can't take out new positions on Russian ruble um, due to the fact that um, it's sanctioned. And you may well get some moves on it when Russian stock markets reopen and people are able to get out of their Russian positions. So um, given the fact that the Russians have closed their stock market until a, the 8th of March now, from the 5th to the 8th, 5th, 5th to the 8th, 5th to the 8th. Um, you might see some movement in Russian ruble then, but we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But at the moment, it's it's on reduce. So um, unless you've already got a position in Russian ruble, you can't take out any new ones. Well, everything has a junk value. I've just Someone's just said, hopefully it has a junk value. Everything has a junk value. Um, it's just not. It's just well below what its current value is, I would suggest. Um, so, as I say, this is this is currently where we are. I think I've covered all the major major support levels for the major markets. If I haven't, please let me know so that I can cover it for you. Otherwise, given the fact that this payrolls number was had a couple of interesting bits in it to summarise. An increase in the participation rate, positive, and slightly disappointing, a decline in the average early earnings numbers, which has prompted a little bit of dollar weakness in the short to medium term. But in the wider scheme of things, the wider theme is basically what's been driving markets today. And obviously that's events in um, in southern Ukraine and the attack on the uh, the nuclear power plant and i think that's the bigger that's the bigger concern at the moment if you've got a russian president who's fairly blase about attacking nuclear installations or saying that he's prepared to use nuclear weapons don't be surprised if um, markets are a bit jittery and that's what we're seeing today so all i would say is please be nimble please be safe don't take too many risks and I hope you all have a very pleasant weekend. And hopefully, um, we'll speak to you all same time, uh, same place, um, four to five weeks from now, um, on the uh, on the first of April. Hopefully, um, assuming nothing bad has happened. Otherwise, I'll wish you all adios, because my voice is now starting to give out a little bit. And uh, um, catch up with my weekly video, uh, which you can find on the website. Thanks very much for listening, guys, and have a, hope you all have a great weekend.